Welcome to Vita Day Africa. Eight years ago, our daughter was in grade 11. We were planning to move to a new town in her matricia. Rickett's mother had just passed away. His father was grieving. My parents were sick and suffering. All of them staying with us or close to us and all very much dependent on us. They were our full responsibility. Our boys were at university. Rickett was away two weeks of every month. I was working full time and menopausal and to say the least, not coping at all. I remember sitting on the stoop in the sun and hearing Jesus say, Pip, you are a control freak. You need to relinquish control to me. Firstly, it was a new idea to me to think that I was a control freak. I have always been the calm, easygoing, peacekeeping one of the family. Everyone around me thought I was happy-go-lucky. But my anxiety levels were through the roof. I was finding it very difficult to hide my true feelings and it was becoming obvious that something had to give. Thus started a journey with Jesus that is still going on today. Jesus is steadily delivering me from myself. I have been a follower of Jesus for 35 years. I truly love the Lord. How can it be that control is still an issue in my life? Part of the reason is because for many years I didn't know it was there. And part of the reason is because when I did see it, I didn't know what to do with it. I have had to learn how to address control on Jesus' terms. Isn't he wonderful? He walks with us for months and years and knows all our failings and sin and he gently teaches us and delivers us from many things along the way. And then one day he reveals something else in our lives that has been there all along and he says, about this issue, let's deal with this one now. Jesus knows when it is the right time to speak and he waits until he hears the Father say now and then he obeys. For me, this is totally foreign. Jesus knows everything and yet he waits. Waiting for a control freak is impossible. Action is everything. When I know something, I must act upon it. Control freaks take control. They get things done and they get recognition for their efforts. People will often say they don't know what they would have done without the help of control freaks. And let's be honest, it's lovely to be needed. Things get hairy when Jesus says wait. And the control freak in me says never. That's where I begin to get stressed. There's a tension between what my whole person demands and what my Lord commands. I can't understand why it doesn't do anything. This is crisis management and if I don't get involved everything is going to be a total disaster. And Jesus says, no. But Lord, my child will be thrown into jail if I don't intervene. What if my husband dies without the Lord and I haven't done everything in my power to convince him to repent? If I don't supervise my parents' old age plans, they will become destitute and filthy and malnourished. If I don't tell my daughter she has taken the wrong turn off, we will be late for church. 
If I don't have a new outfit for the reunion, people will think my husband is poor. My house must always be garden and home standard so that people will have no reason to criticize. I correct my husband constantly so that others won't have a chance to do so. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Jeremiah 17, 5-10 Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Trust in man, myself and my own opinions included opposes trust in God. When we place our trust in man, our hearts have already turned away from the Lord. Jesus said we cannot serve two masters because we will love the one and hate the other. He was speaking about money, but the statement is true in general. Money represents the provision of the flesh as opposed to the provision of God. How often do I say I am following Jesus and trusting him, but in truth I am trusting in myself? I only need Jesus to give me the strength to continue what I am doing. And what is that? I am controlling my life. When I feel out of control, I am filled with fear and anxiety, so I fight tooth and nail to regain control. I have a vague nagging inside me telling me that I don't really have control, but I suppress the thought and continue on because any other option means disaster. Or does it? Cursed is the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his strength and by doing so has already turned his heart away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the past places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Have you felt like that shrub? I have. Many, many times. I smile and wave because the control freak in me has to sh a show to keep up. But inside I am withering away. Fearful. Stressed. Anxious and feeling very, very alone. Jesus said that a tree would be recognized by the fruit it bears. Most times, I don't know what is going on in my heart. I don't really want to look at what drives me to do what I do. What I can't ignore is the fruit. When the fruit is bad, I may not always know what is wrong, but I do know something is wrong. When I feel dry, lifeless, anxious, fearful, I know this is the bad fruit of a bad tree. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David's prayer in Psalm 139. Things I need to discover. One, 
Me fighting for control over my life places me in opposition to God. Is that a place I want to be? 2. Control isn't something that only affects me. In order to keep control of my life, I have to control other people too. That means I sin against the people I love and those who I fight so hard to protect. 3. I don't need to merely change my actions. I need a change of heart. Only Jesus can bring about that depth of change. The one who knows my every thought, he can change my heart if I let him. He waits until I ask him. He waits. 4. Control freaks find themselves saying, Okay, now I see this and I will fix it. I will no longer control. What we find so hard to understand is that me trying to change myself is still me being in control. I need to get to the point where I say, Lord Jesus, there is no hope in me changing myself. I have tried and failed. I have hurt myself and hurt my loved ones. I have turned my heart away from you and I have tasted the fruit of my rebellion. I am lost and broken. I repent of my evil heart. I repent of my incessant need to be in control. I fall on my knees before your throne of grace and mercy. Change my heart, O God. Make me ever new. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. 5. Once we have come to God in repentance and He has touched us, we now need to continue studying Him and His ways. Jesus said, I and only I am the way, the truth and the life. We need to learn from Him. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling. You said no. We will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away. And we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, at the threat of five you shall flee, till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice, blessed are those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion in Jerusalem, you shall weep no more, he will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more, but your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Then you will defile your carved idols, overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, Be gone. And he will give rain for the seed with which you sow the ground, and bread the produce of the ground, with which, which will be rich and plenteous. Isaiah 30, 15-22 this scripture has taught me so much about how God works. He offers salvation, but it is on His terms. 
In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling and you said no. Returning from where? From my own ways. I need to return to the God of my salvation and I need to rest in Him. All my striving is for naught. He alone can save. Being quiet before Him in total trust, therein lies my strength. Quietness and trust are both very difficult for a control freak. Test yourself. Think of the last big crisis you have experienced. If you are a follower of Christ, you probably prayed hard about the issue. You explained to the Lord all the implications of the situation. You spent hours going through every aspect from every angle and you came up with a plan. In all honesty, was there a moment where you sat quietly, waiting confidently for the Lord's input? Could you thank Him for His full control over the situation and trust Him to work it out? Or did you say, I have a plan, I will do it my way. When we refuse, God, refuse God's salvation, He lets us experience the consequence of our choice. He doesn't say, oh shame, poor child, we can't let you suffer. God allows us to feel the anguish of a life lived without Him, so that we will realize the fullness of hopelessness when we are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain. Think of Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. The father gave his son what he demanded and then he let his son go. And then the father waited. He waited for his son to return. The father knew his son was heading out into disaster, but he knew it was his son's choice, and he waited for his return. And when he saw his son in the distance, the father ran. The scripture in Isaiah 30 says, He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself any more. But your eyes shall see your teacher, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. One of the things control freaks can't do is allow their children or loved ones to eat the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Control freaks feel they must protect them from all difficulties. We nag, we fight, we demand. If all else fails, we manipulate them onto the right path. Their lives are in our hands after all. If we fail to protect them, we have lost control. God shows us a different way. God gives us his truth and he allows us to choose. And when we choose to go our own way, he allows us to experience the consequence of our choice and he waits for our return. God never manipulates. God never says, I told you so. Those are the ugly tactics of control freaks. When we repent of our sin, we receive his full forgiveness and then we learn to walk on this new and foreign road called submission. Isaiah 30.22 says, Then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, Be gone. Control is an idol. We can decorate it with silver or gold and think it is a desirable thing or we can downplay it by saying it is natural and so in some way acceptable to God. But he will bring us to the point where we see it for what it is. 
It is undesirable, unclean and evil and we must make no place for it in our lives. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Romans 13 verse 14. Control keeps my eyes focused on myself, how I present, how I succeed, how I achieve, how I measure up. With myself at the center of my life, I am always full of fear because deep down in my DNA, I know I can never be good enough. Submission means I focus on the only one who is good enough the only one who is worthy, the only beloved Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Submission brings freedom from fear because it is not I who lives anymore, but Christ who lives in me. It is no longer my achievements or failures that count, but His Lordship that overshadows all. Instead of feeling insignificant, I now feel secure. It's not about me. It's all about Him. Now when I am anxious about a loved one, I can step back and thank Jesus that He is in control. I can thank Him that He is using this situation to teach me more about Him and His ways. I can command my inward being to be still and to wait on the Lord. I can wait quietly and confidently for the Lord of my salvation to work what for me is impossible. I still have this war inside me between my own will to control and submission to God's will and way. The temptation to take back control is always lurking close by. But now that I have experienced the peace that passes all understanding when I stay on my knees at Jesus' feet, it becomes easier for me to surrender. Beloved brothers and sisters, be encouraged. This is a journey that will take your whole life. You will stumble and fall. You will make mistakes. You will find yourself in a place where you have grabbed back the reins from Jesus and you will be confronted with His Lordship. And you will sometimes be embarrassed by your failures. And sometimes you will be fearful and angry. But if you want to be a follower of Christ, you must learn this lesson well. It's been eight years since Jesus confronted me on the stoop. He has used affliction and adversity to teach me submission. This last year has been one of my greatest learning schools. Jesus has challenged all my carefully formulated beliefs about my role as mother, wife and woman. He has demanded submission to his truth and I am learning to see life through his eyes and I am being changed. If this has touched your heart in any way, please pray with me. Lord Jesus, there is no hope in me changing myself. I have tried and I have failed. I have hurt myself and hurt my loved ones. I have turned my heart away from you and I have tasted the fruit of my rebellion. I am lost and I am broken. I repent of my evil heart. I repent of my incessant need to be in control. I fall on my knees before your throne of grace and mercy. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever new. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. Amen. Now could we solve it?